I will uh, I will begin with a uh, with a word of prayer here. I think everybody who's here is here. So, <clears throat> dearly Father, we uh, thank you uh, for this day again. I thank you for this class and this time we have to study your creation. Just pray that you'd uh, help us to use this time wisely to learn more uh, together. Lord, in your name, I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, you guys got questions about the homework? Ask away. And of course, you know, as a general point of order, if you have questions about the homework some other day, you can ask me before class and I'll try to fit it in, you know. It is your class. <clears throat> I can always post a video if I mess something up. <laughs> have you guys seen the video? Yes. Okay. So I finished that example we did last class. I found the eigenvectors. It took me some time. Um, like, through whatever quirk of fate, the problems we've done in class, calculationally, to find eigenvectors, they've been pretty simple. And um, in that some sense, that was a quirk of fate. Um, if you believe in that sort of thing, I don't. And um, it's God's providence. But uh, anyway, um, the ones I tried to do in the video, those were hard. In fact, so hard, for the complex example, I really couldn't quite get the calculation to go, which isn't to say it can't be done. It just means that it requires an attention to detail that's beyond my grasp the night I made the video. So you guys are younger and probably smarter than me, so you probably could uh, <clears throat> probably could do it. But so questions? No questions. So you guys figured out all the homework? No. Yeah. Section 5.6, but I don't know if we've that. No, no. I mean, I, I think the homework's due Friday, right? Due oh, it's due Monday. I should push it up to Friday, then this makes more sense. I don't agree. No? <laughs> okay. Hmm. All right, well, in that case, fine. Ask me questions Friday, then. So, well, you have questions about 5.6. That's fine. You can ask. I think I... I mean, you can ask. To classify the origin in the tractor, repeller, or saddle point. Okay, so, so yeah, class. What is it, what, What's this? A tractor, repeller, or what is it? Saddle. Saddle. So, as we're solving the, um, you know, dx dt equals to ax, where x is equal to, let's say, you know, x1, uh, oops, uh, x1, x2, right? As you think about it, if you look and you, and you think about the totality of the um, uh, kind of solutions we found, let's think about what happens. So for this matrix A, depending on whether or not it has um, positive eigenvalues, it could have negative eigenvalues, right? So like one kind of solution we found basically looks like this, right? X is equal to C1 e to the alpha 1t times u1 plus C2 e to the alpha 2t times u2, right? Where u1 and u2 are eigenvectors and alpha 1 and alpha 2 are eigenvalues, right? That's the general eigen solution. Supposing that there exist real eigenvalues, right? So the Friday before break, I derived this from changing coordinates and then just integrating the decoupled equation, remember? So like that's one thing that can happen. The other thing that could happen is we also saw we had x is equal to like c1 e to the alpha t uh, cos beta t a, some square, square brackets here, minus sine beta t b plus C2, e to the alpha t, sine beta t, a, uh, plus cos beta t, b, right? So what this was is C1, real part of e to the lambda t, u, plus C2, imaginary part 
of e to the lambda tu in the case that lambda is alpha plus i beta, right? These are two different kinds of solutions that I've described in this class so far, both stemming from eigenvectors, right? The real eigenvectors give us these two, you know, exponentials times a vector for our solution, right? And the complex case gives us, again, exponentials times vectors, but there's also sines and cosines involved, right? So, um, attractor, repeller, saddle point, it's very easy to understand. Um, so what happens, let's just, I mean, let me just think, let me ask you guys a question. So if, let's say alpha 1 and alpha 2 are both less than 0, then, um, so I'm talking, let me, let me talk about this about, um, uh, or, or, or alpha, I, I guess I can, If, if, if all of those are less than zero. That's not how I want to say it. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll figure out how to say it in a second here. So if they're both less than zero, there's different cases. How do you organize the cases? Let me call this case one and case two, right? So for case one, if both of the constants are less than zero, what happens? As t goes to infinity, if you've got e to a minus number, you know, a negative number times time, what happens as t goes to infinity? It goes to zero, right? So this solution will go to zero. If both of the eigenvalues are negative, it goes to zero. That would be what we would call an attractor because the origin, the solutions are attracted to the origin. If on the other hand, <clears throat> and I'm sure this is described in his section, which of course I've read. Um, eh. <laughs> um, if alpha one and alpha two I mean, I have read them at some point, but it's been a while. Um, and the origin is a repeller. Because if both of the eigenvalues are positive, as t goes to infinity, wherever your solution starts, it goes infinitely far away from the origin, right? Both of the terms blow up. The solution goes way, way, way. All right? Do you see that the same story will be true? In the case of number two, like likewise, the same is true if you have alpha less than zero here and if you have alpha greater than zero. So this would be, it's, you know, this would spiral inward and this would be a spiral outward. Because the sine and cosines make it, make it, well, that was cool, make it kind of wrap around the origin. And depending on whether the exponential is positive or negative, it'll either spiral in or spiral out, right? And um, saddle point. How do you get a saddle point? Saddle point is, well, you guys know what a saddle point looks like, right? So it's like this way one way, and it's like that way another way, right? So you go, you know, away, or you, I mean, well, anyway. But the, that, that doesn't quite do it justice. That says, it's not really the right thing to think about. I'm sorry I wrote that. But <clears throat> so saddle point would be when you've got one eigenvalue positive and one eigenvalue negative. So think about this. If you had, if you had like alpha one greater than zero and if you had like alpha two less than zero, then depending on your initial conditions, you can get vastly different end time behavior. The asymptotic behavior of the solution is vastly different for slightly different initial conditions. If I have initial conditions which make C1 equal to non-zero, but they make C2 equal to zero, well, let me just say this. It, it, rather, if C1 is non-zero, period, it will eventually blow up, all right? It doesn't matter if C2 is, if C2 is non-zero, that, that term goes away, right? On the other hand, if C1 is zero, then eventually the solution goes to zero. So depending on whether your initial conditions makes C1 um, non-zero or zero, you'll either get a solution which goes to infinity or just stays at the origin. That's the behavior of a saddle point. A saddle point's an un unstable equilibria, if you like. Now the terminology, I've tried to explain it in two dimensions because you can kind of picture things, right? Like a, 
an unstable spiral looks something like this. You know, a sta stable spiral would be spiraling in, right? And you can actually graph solutions spe for specific problems and see things like this. But this terminology and the understanding extends equally well to higher dimensions, where I wouldn't want to try to draw a picture necessarily. See, if you have a three-dimensional solution and all the eigenvalues are negative, your solution has just exponentials with negative arguments. So as time goes to infinity, you're drawn to the origin. It's a stable uh, attractor. I mean, it's an attractor. If all your eigenvalues are positive, it's a repeller. If you have a mix of positive and negative eigenvalues, it's going to be a saddle. So this story continues to like three or four or whatever. Although I think your homework only has two or three. Yeah, probably just two. Now, if you want to see a much more complete discussion of this, you can look at like a later chapter in Nagel, Saf, and Snyder if you've got that book. Although it depends on the edition. There used to be a really good a whole chapter on stability of systems of differential equations in the, the, uh, your usual differential equations book, but uh, it depends on the edition. I don't remember if the current edition you guys are using has it or not. So, Other questions? Was that, that was the main question you had? Or? Okay, the other thing I haven't told you guys about yet, there's two main things that are bothering me that I've been meaning to put into other lectures, but I haven't yet. The one is this following theorem, which is this. If A transpose is equal to A for A in R n by n, then A is orthonormally that's a mouthful. Orthonormally uh, diagonalizable. So what this means is that there exists eigenbasis, which is orthonormal, and all your eigenvalues are real. This is just a nice, nice result to know about, so you know what you're getting into. If you're finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors for a symmetric matrix, good news, it can be done. Better news, it can be done in an orthonormal way, which means that when we diagonalize the matrix, our transpose of the basis matrix is just the inverse. That makes symmetric matrices really, really nice. Um, this theorem is sometimes called the, uh, the real spectral theorem. <coughs> Now, you might wonder what spectral means. Have you guys ever talked about um, spectroscopy? You guys ever heard of that, like in chemistry? So it's the study of, you know, the particular light patterns that particular elements um, release as they undergo chemical interactions, right? Spectroscopy. And um, one of the things that prompted the, uh, you know, development of linear algebra in the early 20th century was the study of spectroscopy because that was linked to quantum mechanics and thus the term spectrum. Yeah. Oh, no, that was not a question. Okay. Sorry, I'm thirsty for questions. Okay, so that's one thing. And so what that means then for such a matrix, you can find beta V1 through Vn, right? Such that AV1, AV, uh, AVJ, is lambda jvj, and if you look at the basis matrix and you multiply it, it's transposed by itself, you get the identity, right? And just to complete the story, we're saying that if we take the, the transpose of the basis matrix times A times the basis again, <coughs> we get the diagonal matrix with eigenvalues down the diagonal. So from this, we can easily derive a couple of identities that I've claimed, but I've never really proved for you guys, but we should take a second to prove them. <sighs> what happens if you take the trace of, of this identity? So notice that the trace has that, remember trace of AB is trace of uh, 
um, BA, so I can like you know put the beta first and then put a beta transpose A like that. Um, the the right hand side just calculate the trace. It's what lambda one, lambda two, lambda n. I'm being kind of stupid here because I'm calculating this identity in a special context. I don't really need, we don't have to have this, uh, it doesn't have to be a symmetric matrix. All right, like, uh, this calculation would still go through even if you just had like P inverse AP, right? Um, but anyway, so those are the identity. And so we got the trace of A is the sum of the eigenvalues, right? And what happens, <coughs> excuse me, what happens if you take the determinant of the equation? You see what you get? Because the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. A very similar calculation gives us the determinant of A is the determinant of the diagonal matrix, which is just the product of the eigenvalues. All right? So that's super nice. I've, I've mentioned this on occasion as a means to check our calculations, right? What else can we do with diagonalization while I'm on this, this uh, well, I guess it's not a rant, but <clears throat> we get angry. No, I'm sorry, I'm just not angry today. I'm going to try, but um, so let's see here. Shifting gears a bit. If we have that the diagonal matrix is P inverse AP, right? So what I'm saying is that suppose you've got matrix A, and it's diagonalizable, right? So that means that it's similar to, a, similar to a diagonal matrix. Check this out. Then, so this just trick will help you calculate some things. If I want to calculate a to the power k, right, how would I do that? Well, notice that this equation I can solve for a by doing what? a is equal to what? Can you guys solve for A? Multiply on the what? On the left, we multiply by P. On the right, we multiply by P inverse. And so we get P, D, P inverse, right? And OK, well, what is A to the, K, A to the power K? Well, it's A like that, K of those. Which then, if we just put in what we just did, P, D, P inverse, P, D, P inverse, P, D, P inverse, K fold times, P, D, P inverse, right? What happens to all the interior copies of P inverse P? They just give you I, that's right. So I, 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 I. So I, and when we multiply I times D, right? Um, and this one, likewise, there's an I here, right? So that gives us P, D, I, 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 Anyway, P, D to the K, right? P inverse. Which is actually super useful because like, <laughs> you know, um, so for, you know, uh, assuming that we're talking about D being a diagonal, right, then we can understand that this P is the matrix for the base, for an eigenbasis. So it must be that D is actually the, uh, has this form here. And so what we're really looking at is P Le like this lambda matrix to the k, so we could do like lambda 1 to the k power, lambda 2 to the k power, da da da, lambda, however many they are, I guess n, to the k power times p inverse. And see, so if the, you know, if you're asked to find a formula for the nth power of a matrix, don't try to do it directly. <laughs> what you do, you diagonalize the matrix and use this, because then all you have to do, it's easy. This is, this is simple, you just write it down, and then you just have to multiply by the basis matrix and its inverse, like that, and then you've got it. You've got the, power, the formula for the kth power of a matrix. 
that make sense? That's kind of a sneaky, a kind of sneaky application um, of this diagonalization business, all right? So the, 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 the big idea of diagonalization is that when a, a matrix problem is ugly, if we can change to eigencoordinates, that makes it easy. We solve it there, and then we transform back. That's, that's the idea here. Um, I made that explicit, again, the Friday before break, where we derived the, uh, the differential equation solution from changing to eigencoordinates, which decoupled it, and then we were able to track back. All right, um, another, mention, another thing I should probably mention is that, you know, let's see your example, eh, where are we? Oh, I guess this is example one. Um, so check this out, guys. If, if we have AV is equal to lambda V, right? What happens if I multiply this equation by A? What is a times a? a squared, right? And what happens here? I bring the lambda out. I get a v, right? But that's what? Lambda, lambda v, right? By what we're assuming at the start, which is also known as lambda squared v. So what, what, does, uh, what does this mean? a squared v equal to lambda squared v for v not equal to zero, right? If I say v is not equal to zero up here, it means what? v is eigenvector, right? With eigenvalue blank for what? Fill in the blanks for me. I know it's early, but I shouldn't have to do all the work in here. Yeah. There we go. And that's what I was looking for. So for the matrix A squared, when we multiply the vector V, we get the number lambda squared times V. That makes V an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda squared for A squared. What do you think happens if we multiply again? What's A cubed <laughs> times V going to be equal to? a squared times a squared v, right? Which is, we just worked that out, right? Oh, excuse me, a times a squared v, which is a times lambda squared v, right? And we can pull the lambda squared out. We got a v, which gives us lambda squared times lambda v, which gives us lambda cubed v, right? So apparently, if we've got an eigenvector for v, then that's, for A rather, that same, that same vector will serve as an eigenvector for the square of the matrix, the cube of the matrix. We could be here all day, right? You can keep doing this. So anyway, I think you have some homework problems which are basically based on this idea. How about this? <clears throat> so this would say that A cubed has eigenvalue lambda cubed for a cubed, you know. So you guys tell me this. If um, a v is equal to lambda v um, for lambda not equal to zero, 
that right? <clears throat> then what can we do? What if we... I guess I ask this question. Oh, let, me, let me say it another way. <clears throat> let me say this a different way. Suppose A inverse exists. Right? Suppose A inverse exists. And AV is equal to lambda V. Can we, what can we do with A inverse here? Well, let me ask a question. How about this? Can, so I'll first ask a question. Can lambda equals to zero? That doesn't seem like very good grammar, but I'm going to stick with it. Can lambda equal to zero? Probably should put a question mark there to not do too much offense to the English language. But what do you think? Can lambda be equal to zero? Is it possible to have zero as an eigenvalue if the matrix is invertible? Why or why not? For zero to be an eigenvalue, what would that mean? That would mean that A <laughs> times V is equal to zero for V not equal to zero. Remember our list of equivalent conditions for invertibility of matrix? One of those conditions was that the homogeneous equation only has the zero solution. But to say that lambda is zero is an eigenvalue is to say it has more than one solution. It has at least the zero solution and the non-zero solution V. So no, it's impossible. What's an easier way to see it? There's a formula right over there. The determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. If one of those is zero, the product is zero, right? So no, if the determinant's non-zero, if one of these is zero, the product is zero, but it's supposed to be not equal to zero if it's invertible, right? That's a contradiction, we can't have that. Okay? So I think one of your homework problems gives you like invertibility of a matrix and I forget exactly how the homework problem is phrased, but let me just work it. <laughs> I'm not working the homework problem directly, I'm just working problems. What I'm about to do will probably work your homework problem, but you'll forgive me. So if we have this, so can lambda be equal to zero? Nope. So lambda is not equal to zero, right? If lambda is not equal to zero, we have 1 over lambda times AV is equal to V, right? Dividing the equation by lambda. What does that say? I mean, you can interpret this. Can you guys interpret this equation right here for me? What does it say? This says that the matrix 1 over lambda times A has eigenvector V with eigenvalue what? One. Eigenvalue is 1. That's right. So the purpose of this discussion right now, if you haven't gathered, is to try to get you guys to think about the definition of eigenvector a little bit more. We've been doing calculations, and those are good, but we should also take some time and meditate on the definition, right? It doesn't matter. So what else could you do next step? Multiply that, ma multiply that equation by A inverse, what happens? If we multiply by A inverse, what happens? <clears throat> we have 1 over lambda. A inverse times A is just the identity, right? So we just get V is A inverse V, right? What does this tell us? This tells us that the matrix A inverse has eigenvector V with eigenvalue what? Isn't that cool? It's just 1 over lambda, right? The inverse matrix has 
the eigenvalue lambda to the minus one, which of course here means one over lambda. Remember, we don't use the notation one over the matrix because it's ambiguous because of the left-right multiplicity of, uh, the, the non-commutative matrix multiplication forbids us to use that notation, right? So, but for a number, we can do that. Okay, so, yeah. I hope these comments help you with your homework. I think they will. Let us do a example. <coughs> I hope you guys are working on the computer project. I don't think you'll find that's something you can do in a day. <coughs> you know? There's a fair amount in there. And, you know, well, I will be amused if there's some kind of horrible typo in it. Um, if I find out about it from the day before it's due from you guys. Mm. Mm. I would be less happy. <laughs> So there may be, you know, this, this problem, this, this, the computer project is something I wrote up, all right? I didn't copy it from a book or something. So if you need further explanation about what's being asked in the problem, you should find out what those questions are and ask them of me as to do the project <laughs> in an orderly fashion, all right? So um, anyway. Where was I? Oh, wrong notebook. So let's look at a nice, as I showed you guys in the video, if you haven't seen the video yet, it's okay. Like you're not really, what I'm about to do won't, doesn't, doesn't depend on the video at all, really. In the, in the video, there's just much suffering, much suffering, right? In the video I suffer, I try to solve a three by three and I find that it is actually quite, quite a pain if the 3x3 three three is too ugly. But here's a 3x3 three three we can do in class and it won't be too bad. Oh, wait a minute. Wrong page. Oh, I did put this note to myself. Here it is. Thank you, me. Yay. So example two, or maybe is that all one example? I guess it's all one example. I should have numbered those like examples three, four, five, six. I felt like I got more done. Um, A equals two, one, one, minus one, one, zero, 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 and three. Okay? So, How's this going to work? So uh, what we want to do is to um, find um, solution to dx dt equals to ax. And we're going to do that by finding the eigenvalues. We're going to do a couple things. We're going to find the solution to dx dt equals to ax. We're also going to diagonalize this matrix but not in the real sense, in the complex sense. We're going to complex diagonalize this. I think that's what we're going to do. Now, first of all, the theorem I just erased in the middle board does not apply, right? Is this symmetric? It is not. Now, that's not an if and only if theorem, all right? There do exist um, matrices which are diagonalizable and yet are not symmetric, okay? Um, I think the, well, that's something we'll talk about in 321. I'll just say that. Um, anyway, so, um, so here, what do, we, what do we start with? Well, we want to calculate the um, characteristic equation, right? So that's going to be 1 minus lambda, 1 um, minus 1, 1 minus lambda, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3 minus lambda. All right. And what's that? Well, that's nothing more than lambda minus one quantity squared uh, plus one, big parentheses here, times three minus lambda. And okay, well, wonderful, now that's enough. 
See, because this immediately tells me, because I understand completing the square, that that is lambda is equal to 1 plus or minus i. And this right here tells me that um, lambda 2, if you like, is equal to 3. Now, I really should pick, I'm going to erase the minus. I'm just going to put, I'm just going to choose the plus i root, okay? As we've discussed, if you, if you have the complex eigenvector, then the conjugate of it is the eigenvector of the conjugate of the eigenvalue. So, and just one will do for what we're doing, all right? So just, just get one of them. All right, so there you go. And um, so we'll do the easy part first. Let's do the three. So like, what's a minus three i? So let's take, let's, let's find, uh, I guess, you know, I'm going to call this, I'm going to call this three, lambda three, just, uh, so I'm going to find u three first, just to be weird. Um, u3 for lambda 3 equals to 3. Is that enough 3's for you? Let's see here. So a minus 3i times u3 is what? Uh, let's see here. So we've got minus 2, 1, minus 1, minus 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0. And that's u, v, w. So the quickest way I know to think about this calculation, I'm trying to find you know, the solution for this being 0. So I, what jumps out at me is that w is free. There's no equation involving w whatsoever, right? And so really, this is the same as just the system minus 2, 1, minus 1, minus 2 times uv equal to zero, right? But this is invertible. How do I know that? I calculate the determinant. The determinant of that matrix is four plus one, which is five, which is non-zero. Therefore, that's invertible. Therefore, u and v are both zero. So, hence, u3 is zero, zero, w. But, so we'll pick u3 equals to 0, 0, 1 because we just need 1. All right, so there's our eigenvector for eigenvalue 3, just 0, 0, 1. Okay. So, to be clear, in these kinds of calculations, guys, I'm not terribly interested in the mechanics of how you solve these. I'm interested that you be able to find the eigenvector and, f and know that you're correct. So if you could guess that E3 was the eigenvector with eigenvalue 3 here and just state it with conviction and correctness, that would suffice for a calculation here. And it's actually kind of obvious that E3 is an eigenvector with eigenvalue 3 here because if you look at column 3, it's 3 times E3. And what happens when you multiply E3 times a matrix? Well, it picks out the third column, right? So yeah, E3 is an eigenvector with eigenvalue 3, because E3 times this matrix is 3 times E3. That's why it's important to know the definition of the eigenvector, so that you don't, you're not a slave to calculation, right? You can also guess solutions when they're guessable. Of course, they're not always guessable, right? Like, the things I showed you in the video were very much unguessable. <laughs> I mean, as far as I can, as far as I can cipher, anyway. I have, if, I, if, if it forces me to get out MATLAB, it's a bad problem, right? <sighs> um, now, I do think that those problems are marked in lay with like an M, which I think means MATLAB. So it, I was warned, right? But anyway, my foolish pride. Okay. As opposed to my unfoolish pride. Let's see here. So. How about this one? Lambda 1, this one's going to turn out better though. Lambda 1 is 1 plus i. So we want to look at a minus 1 plus i times i, 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 um, times u1. All right, well that is, all right, let's think about this. What is 1, what is, I'll write it down here. What's 1 minus 1 plus i? That's equal to what? Minus i, right? We get a minus i here. The 1 
is still what it is. Minus 1 is still minus 1. And that other one also simplifies to minus i. I still got the 0 here. I got the 0 here. I got a 0 here. I got a 0 here. And there I've got, what, let's see, we're working out down here. What's 3 minus 1 plus i? What you got there? You got, looks like a 2. Uh, two, 2 minus i. OK? So we're trying to find the eigenvector here. So <coughs> this is far more likely the kind of 3 by 3 problem you'd see on the test, right? Because this is a 3 by 3 problem you could actually calculate competently and not take an hour to do it, <laughs> right? Not like that evil problem 17. OK, enough about that. Still, you know, recovering from it. So um, 2 minus i w equals to 0 is the third equation, right? So therefore, w, w is 0, because 2 minus i is a non-zero number we can divide by it. Right? Non-zero complex numbers you can divide by. So then what? Well, we're really only up against what? Um, we've got minus i times u plus v equals to 0. And we've got minus u minus iv equals to 0, right? What happens if you multiply? What happens if you multiply the third equation by i? What does that get you to? What's i squared? Well, minus i squared is what? That's one, right? Minus a minus one is one. So what I'm saying is that the, 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 um, the first equation is simply the second equation multiplied by i. So the first and the second equation are actually the same equation. So if I want to find the solution set, I can, I can either use the first equation or the second equation, whatever floats our boat. What do you guys like? I think I like, uh, I like the first. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with this one. So this tells me that v is i u, all right? That's my choice. I'm choosing u to be a parameter, apparently. So I'm going to let u equals to 1. That is a choice, an ad hoc choice, right? But with this somewhat ad hoc choice, I get my eigenvector u1 is 1 i 0. And that gives me. 1, 0, 0 plus i times 0, 1, 0. Man, this problem is really nice. This right here is a. This right here is b in the nomenclature I introduced last class. a and b being the real and the imaginary parts of the complex eigenvector, respectively. Okay. Now that we have all this, we can write the solutions down. So dx dt equals to ax has solution x equals to c1 e to the 3t um, oh, 0, 0, 1. And then you've got plus c2. And let's see here. My eigenvalue was 1 plus i. So I get t. And then, so here, th this one here, we had lambda equals 1 plus i. That makes alpha equals to 1, and the beta equals to 1 um, in, the, in the language I introduced last time. So e to the alpha t, I've got cosine t times a, which was, what was my a? 1, 0, 0, minus the sine of t times b, which is 0, 1, 0, um, and then plus c3 e to the t sine t, 1, 0, 0, plus cosine t, 0, 1, 0. And the book usually likes to do one more. Like, I'm perfect. So, like, uh, for the test, guys, if I have one of these and I say solve it, unless I say otherwise, you can leave the answer like that. Now, if I say find the solution, write your answer, 
you know, simplify the answer, then I'd want you to go one more step. The one more step would be this. Um, so this is like, let me see here, let me see if I can put it all together. So I get zero from here. I've got, you know, C2 e to the t cosine t, nothing else, plus C3, C3 e to the t sine t. And um, let's see what else goes on. For my y, uh, minus C2 e to the t sine t, and uh, plus C3 e to the t cos t, and then um, C1 e to the 3t down here. So, and what, we're, what we'll be solving, right, is dx dt, this solves dx dt, or dx1 dt rather, equal to x1 plus x2, dx2 dt equals to x minus x1 plus x2, and dx3 dt is equal to x3. Right, this has these as the solution. There's my x1, there's my x2, there's my x3 explicitly. Okay? Now, <clears throat> this problem is easy. Why? Why is this problem easy? The problem is easy because the matrix actually has a block diagonal form to start with, right? Which is to say that the differential equation, the variables between the first and second, like x1 and x2 differential equation is uncoupled from the x3 differential equation, right? So that's, par that's why this problem worked out so nice. There's no intertwingling, <laughs> if you will, between the, the 1, 2, and the 3. Now, we could also do the following. We could, um, let's see here. If we were to calculate, um, if we were to put, say, 1, 1, i, 0, um, 1, minus i, 0, and then 0, 0, 1, inverse, times the matrix, 1, 1, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 3, that inverse times 1, 1, i, minus i, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, what would we get? Could you, could you calculate this, by the way, without like taking forever? How would this be calculated? Remember, it's a block diagonal matrix, right? So you could actually calculate that by the inverse of this two by two, which we've got a stone cold formula for, right? Like that would be the inverse because one over one is one. If I had another five minutes, we could actually do this calculation and explicitly see that what this works out to is one plus i, one minus i, and three. So this is a so-called complex diagonalization of the matrix, All right? Technically speaking, the matrix as it's given is already in what's called real Jordan form. So this this matrix is an example of what's called quote unquote real Jordan form, which is not something you're going to find in lay, but I have more to say about that eventually. <coughs> anyway, I hope you guys, I hope that made sense to you. We can put together the two different methods that we've talked about, right? The complex and the real, they, they can be put together. In fact, they have to be put together in the three by three case because we always have a real eigenvalue for three by three, because every cubic real equation has a real root. That's it for today.